Good afternoon, Cube community, and welcome back to Super Cloud 7. We've been spending the entire power-packed day of over 17 segments getting you ready for the next generation data platform. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined by a trifecta of brilliant lads. We've got Dave Vellante, John Furrier, and Rob Streche. What a day, gentlemen. Unbelievable, unbelievable. The talent that was here on the Cube um, and share, experts sharing their opinion SuperCloud 7 day was a big hit. The survey, the mother of all surveys, <laughs> the day next data platform survey you guys put out, co-op is right here, really Great highlights that, what we've been saying and everyone's saying the same thing. This next data platform is going to look a lot different than what it was before as a data warehouse and different than the data clouds of Snowflake and previous Databricks. And the two founders, co-founders of both Snowflake and Databricks came on. That was unprecedented, great event, and of course, the last the rest of the lineup was awesome. You know, when when John and I it was um, it was December of 2021 when we sort of said, "Wow, the super cloud thing is is happening." And of course, we got a lot of grief for that because uh, it's such a buzzy name. But it's interesting to me when you hear companies like Walmart and companies like TransUnion talk about how they've essentially built an abstraction layer to hide the underlying complexity of all these clouds and create an, a developer experience that's consistent across those clouds, irrespective of the physical location. I mean, and they say, well, it's kind of your super cloud thing. Yeah. And so, and John, you've said to really take advantage of AI, it needs super cloud. That's going to be the, one of the superpowers. And so it's really, frankly, it's really satisfying to see that yeah. come to life. Um, it is a, a buzzy word, marketing word, blah, blah, blah. But it's actually a real thing. It did play out exactly as we thought, yeah, Dave, didn't it? Yeah. I, well, so, I was just going to say, how does, how does your predictions then on SuperCloud 1 compare to SuperCloud 7? John, I'll let you go. Well, I think one thing that played out was that we saw that in order to do multiple clouds or multiple environments, which is also called distributed computing, which is a pretty basic concept, data's got to be horizontally scalable. That we saw that early on. But the rise of Snowflake's dominance early on when they started moving to other clouds, we can see the dots connecting and then Databricks rose out, Rob, and we started to see that data wasn't just the old way to just store it and retrieve it. We saw it as an in, in, instrumental part and then you saw the search paradigm emerging. And then you're in a, a highly available and high availability conversation. That's not, that's not storage, yeah. that's a, that is a data networking. So you know problem. what else, Rob? The number one finding out of SuperCloud One was that the biggest barrier was going to be security and governance. And that's all we're talking about today. And that and and couldn't be a hotter conversation. Right. See, it all comes back around, right? I mean, yeah. we, we've been talking about that all day. And I, I think one of the things that also was going on back then, right, was silos. Yeah. And how do you break down those silos? And I, I think right now, when you talk about the open table formats and what people are looking at, it was, I don't want, super cloud was, I don't want to be locked in to one cloud and open data formats and with table formats is kind of looking and pushing in that direction as well. Even though, and I think you actually had a really good observation between Kubernetes, the rise mm -hmm. of Kubernetes and where we are with you know, 15%, but 70% wanting to go mm -hmm. open table. That adoption curve is really interesting. And I think, you know, part of our job here is market education as well as understanding what's mm -hmm. going on. And I am so curious to see for SuperCloud 8, how much that's changed. I, sp I think we'll see a lot more exploration there to continue the Kubernetes example even faster than we saw in that space because it's a different type of complexity and I think there's a real sense yeah. of urgency right now. And Sanjeev Mohan, one of our Cube uh, Collective uh, members brought up, you should extend the survey beyond Snowflake yeah. and Databricks Agreed. because to your point, there's a bigger impact and we heard it from TransUnion and the end mm -hmm. user customers where it's not about vendor, who's going to win which vendor, it's what what this gonna, environment's going to look like. And you know, it's a platformization. It's not about the tool of the hammer and the nails anymore. It's about the foundational system and companies that figure this out and they are figuring out, it's not just about Snowflake and Databricks, it's about others. So we, I think SuperCloud 8 will be an inclusive list, more inclusive in terms of survey data and, and industry data, but also use cases because they're, TransUnion's end-to-end -end architecture, as others like Capital One and others, mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty badass when you look at what they're doing. I mean, it's, they're way ahead of everybody else. And I think, you know, we saw that with Uber, you know, Uber for the enterprise was you guys coined it, but they had to build it from scratch. I mean, Uber was forced mm -hmm. to build their system, just like Facebook was forced to build their site, big scale. But big old enterprises, Rob, have old legacy states. Well, and, and so they got to manage that. Yeah, and I, I think that 
actually plays into the data that we collected when we went beyond, okay, yes, 100% we're using Snowflake, 100% we're using Databricks, and then you start to break it down where, you know, 20 some odd percent are using data mesh and of some sort and mm -hmm. fashion. And you start to break it down with how many are using Mongo and how many are using others and how many were still like 80%, 70, 80% 70, were still using SQL and were 50% thought they were gonna be using SQL well into next year. So I, I think when you start to look at how all of these pieces really come together, it, it's gonna be a journey. And I think we're in that early you know, minority of people who've gone on this path already. Well, and Ali Gotsu's vision, so compelling, he's so articulate, um, and saying, hey, don't trust anybody with your data, don't trust any vendor with your data, mm -hmm. not even Databricks. Control your own data, who's not going to you know, agree with that message? Especially right the, now. The reality, however, is that that's a really hard thing to govern, and so people are going to have stovepipe governance models, and, and this is the world we live in, right? And Well, that, the survey data, you brought that up in one of the questions. You yep. know, I want to keep my silos. I like them. Well, you know, I, I'm like comfortable or, managing or, them. Or, so yeah. I said it. And until the industry can do an Uber for all or a TransUnion for all or a Walmart for all, that's going to be the norm. Yeah. And this is where Jamak Dagani is trying yeah. to attack that problem. Um, as we've been saying, it, it's definitely a problem and it's probably a technology sort of containerizing you know, those governance layers, but I don't know if it's a business model, we'll see. You know, you guys just want another shout out you to might. you guys authoring the great survey. The questions were phenomenal. I know there's some made it on the cutting room floor. I should have been in. I'll weigh my concerns later. But I want to call your attention to one of the questions on there. Uh, it was the one about the uh, data bricks. But anyway, the one question, Rob, I want to get your thoughts on and Dave, because it's really compelling around the features. So it says, for both Databricks and Snowflake, please indicate what features you're currently using. Oh, yeah. And I think that mm -hmm. question, I mean, that to me lays out that there's a lot of ponies in there, Rob. Yeah. Like, there's a horse in there somewhere. Who? That's a lot of features. So the diversity of use cases to platformize everything, the challenge that the enterprise is going to have is, you can have Snowflake stronghold mm -hmm. in the data warehousing, and Databricks has plenty of beachhead to play over there. So. I, what's your, I mean, how do you see that rationalizing that out? Because does it consolidate? Does it become platformized? What's your vision on that? Well, I mean, I looked at it and said, especially that first one all the way to the left, where it talked about data warehouse and yeah. data, how are you really managing your data and data warehousing? And it was very close, closer than I thought. That one actually- so You're I, surprisingly high for Databricks. Correct. Yeah. correct. I thought Snowflake was going to run away with that one because Mm -hmm. uh, although we know Databricks is growing pretty quickly and you guys can comment on that, but when you start to look at how much room they've made up or are perceived as a really good data warehouse, which was literally synonymous with Snowflake. Yeah. And that one really stuck out to me that it was. Well, it's, I thought Mulham did summarize it pretty well. He said, uh, Snowflake won the database management system war even though what you're just, you know, notwithstanding the point yeah. that you just made. Databricks won the data pipeline war. Now the governance catalog is kind of the, the new, you know, layer of, of battle. And then it's going to be the semantic layer. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be building applications on top of that. And that's really where all the value is, right? I mean, that's, it's going to be all your AI. The semantic things, layer is great. The conversation that we had yes. earlier today as that's well. Right. Yeah. I, th I think we're going to see some emerging players to kind of build on your question a little bit, John. You know, we, we've focused on these two core players because of our survey data recently, obviously both great guests today on the show. I think there's a lot more players and a lot more things in this yeah. ecosystem. And I don't think we know who the, who the champions are. I don't think we know who the FANG companies are going to be in this new orchestration yeah, yeah. of- Who's of, the Magnificent Seven in data? Exactly. Not there's two people now. Well, Oracle could be in there, Dave. Yeah. I mean, they got a database. I, I, heard, I, MongoDB. I heard somebody on TV recently saying, you know, we might not ever see any kind of startup emerge because these big hyperscalers are just going to buy them. I don't buy it. I, I think we are going to see, you know, we talk about cloud native. I think we're going to see AI native companies emerge mm -hmm. that have completely streamlined their processes. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about agentic AI. And age, we're going to see companies built with one tenth the number of employees and they're going to move so fast, they're going to be so efficient, and they, they are going to disrupt. 
Will they get bought? Yes, yeah, some of them will, but some of them are going to do what Zuckerberg said. Do exactly you want a billion want. dollars? No, I'm not yeah. going to take your billion dollars. I'm going to build the future. Well, transforming always, data yeah. and ETL, for instance, that category could go away completely. Google's saying they're doing automatic pipelining. A, I mean, Rob's shaking his head. I'm saying, I, I don't know. Like firewalls, they'll go away. Yeah, yeah, like mainframe, because <laughs> mainframe's got, oh, oh, no, it's actually part of AI now, so. Yeah. But it was we'll interesting, it. to, to Moham's point, if you look at that data, the data engineering stuff, all the pipeline stuff, Databricks definitely dominated. You know, a lot of the reporting and the BI, you know. Was oh, okay, let me, well, let me ask you, got your, you guys this question. In that list of features, we've seen this in every inflection point, yep. when things get platforms, whether it's the internet and the web, mobile, whatever, features aren't companies or categories. Right. Question is, of that list, what goes away from a categorical perspective or as a company, I, no, certainly trans, transformation data and ETL won't go away, but does it get subsumed into something else? I think it gets decomplexified, yeah. absolutely. So, yeah. and, and all these companies and doing it. If it doesn't, it, then those applications won't. <laughs> well, it just won't. It, it won't. I mean, so this all comes, I mean, I, I love that a big backbone of what we talked about today was the developer experience. People are going to want it to be less complex. They're going to want it to be easier. They're going to want it, you don't want it to fit in. And to your point, Dave, that you just made about less people building more faster and it not necessarily being a, a hyperscaler who is the hegemon in this particular ecosystem. I mean, we, when we talked to Johnny Dallas at Z, at each one of our cloud native cons, uh, he, he, I love the fact that sticks out to me so strong, particularly right now, is they are seeing teams do with three that used to do with 300. That's a really big difference in capacity and innovation and what's possible, and particularly with some of the stuff that's open sourced. I was just yeah. looking at the latest from CNCF earlier this afternoon, and there's a whole bunch of projects in, in the FinOps space and in financial security. We're mm -hmm. talking to TransUnion. It's all really relevant, and if some of these products, you know, if smaller teams can do more, if some of this open source stuff comes together, it's going to be whoever optimizes this experience for developers, so it's just as smooth as working on anything else that we've built in the past. Yeah. Well, great point, and TransUnion came on to validate the Johnny Dallas point, because whether you're a startup of three or 30, or 300 like TransUnion, TransUnion's got 300 engineers for their true dev platform. Yep. If this was not the cloud at scale, that'd be 3,000 engineers, because, mm -hmm. You know, the ability to be more optimized. I mean, remember the old days? The big insurance companies would have like 5,000 developers. Yep. 100%. Like yeah. now, you have 300 to. Is a None huge of those number. applications that they built scaled. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then people started building applications mm -hmm. on top of AWS, and, you know, they got the marginal economics, yeah. you know, behind them, and then boom, you had yeah. new I mean, companies formed. But I think that that's. Like Workday. You know. Well, you start to look yeah. at it, and I think it goes back to you. There's always going to be people innovating around the edges of what's going on. And to your point on, yeah. John, on features going away, I, I think that things like data mesh, I think you'll start to see them, like people like Dell are doing with their Dell Data Lake and people like and Esmeral at HPE and others where they're taking different pieces of it where they have the underlying infrastructure, because at the end of the day, this either has to live on cloud or on-prem. And by the way, as we talk about with the power law distribution of Gen AI, that long tail, when you start to look at inference and things of that nature, a lot of that may be at a cell tower. And that's not necessarily a cloud strength is right. being out at that cell tower, even though they, you know, Google announced their little, little cloud AI thing to go out to the, that now, I mean, and Amazon has its outpost its strategy mm -hmm. and snow. I mean, everyone all has that. a strategy, right? Now, so whatever <laughs> yeah. that might yeah. be. But, <laughs> but I, I think again, it goes back to that. I think there's going to be a play still in that long tail, and I think that the the to your point on you know we have two, where are the other five you know Fang companies coming from you know for the magnificent seven of data, I, I think they still haven't been defined. I think there's a lot of acquisitions and mergers that are going to happen. I think space. the acquisition, I think Snowflake is going to be on an acquisition binge because what I saw from Benoit's interview here, uh, clearly, you know, Snowflake is, is gold standard, high quality product, great customer base, very loyal, but they're dying in this survey. Um, you know, when they say Snowflake is very likely to dominate the market in ML AI 3%, uh, when they say Snowflake is That's somewhat uh, likely to dominate the ML market, 18%. And then 30% of the survey said Databricks and Snowflake are roughly equally matched, but yet 38% that said Databricks is going to dominate the AI. So if the AI horse doesn't come in, Dave, then Snowflake is going to survive and thrive. 
if it does, Snowflake has to act, and clearly they're not winning the mindshare of developer community. I talked to Frank. Databricks is blowing, blowing them away in the marketing. So, so uh, I talked to Frank Schlutman about this, but it was right after, so Databricks bought Mosaic, uh, and then um, Snowflake bought uh, Sridhar's company, uh, was it Neva? Neva. Yeah. Uh, and, and Frank Slootman said, look, it's all about this. Yeah, we're paying a lot of money for these things, but it's all about getting the talent. Because yeah. there's only so many people out there mm -hmm. that can really drive this you know, gen AI wave and yeah. you got to have them in house. And Ali said that the tabular act was when you asked them, Huge. he said on camera today, yes. live on the keynote, he's merged the, the best talent on both teams. Yeah, I mean, Delta Lake for and what yeah. the guys at Iceberg have done is, I mean, Ryan Blue will take you through all the detailed stuff that they built and they're like super alpha geeks and did a fantastic. Yeah. They would probably love that you just yeah. called them a super Yeah, I mean, I mean that yeah. as a compliment. I know you yeah. do. They should come on, say, they should come great, on Super Cloud next. Channel. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Super Alpha Geeks, you come on the Super Cloud. Yeah. <laughs> we could have a hall of fame of Super <laughs> Alpha Geeks. <laughs> <laughs> was there anything that surprised anyone today that you weren't expecting to hear? I was surprised with Dipti from Microsoft and how much progress Microsoft's made on some of their data. They are well beyond where I thought they were on open data. They're very much, and I felt authentically that they had that posture. And Satya Nadella, mm. if you remember our first, well, when Open Compute started many years ago, we were there when it launched. We helped form that organization with Facebook and Microsoft donated all their open source. And so we were present at creation. And remember, Microsoft donated a ton of IP to Open Compute. Guess who was in charge of that division at that time? Satya Nadella, he was yet not the CEO. Ballmer was still the CEO. So Satya Nadella has open source in his veins. Facebook too. Part of that. Facebook yep. and Microsoft made open compute. Of course, Intel kind of donated some stuff too. Arista was there. But that was that was just all infrastructure nerds. Microsoft donated that. Now I see them with the Linux movement now with Gen AI. Internally, she said they're all open, open data formats. And it makes sense. That's a good what, strategy for them. What surprised me was Ali Goetze's surprise that people were freaked out at what they did because he just like totally. Uh, I think he said. The I game. think he meant Snowflake was freaked out. But he said some uh, of the vendors, right? I, yeah. bet, I, I don't think it's just Snowflake. We, I want to go no. back to the video chain. I, I don't think it's just Snowflake. Can you go back I, to the replay on that, that one? I think Microsoft, I think AWS, I think Google to maybe to a lesser extent because they're not as tight. But I think definitely Microsoft, AWS and Snowflake were a little freaked out about that, but, but th th I'm surprised he was surprised. I was surprised by what his- he did is he, he just changed the rules of the game. Well, I was surprised by his answer when you asked him the question about how long it's going to take for tabular to work no, he was for you. He that. said two years. Yeah, he was not Elon. He said two to three years, I thought. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. pretty long you know, He was not Elon Musk, like, oh, it'll be next quarter. But, but to, to your point on that, I don't, I don't know if I'm AWS, I'm really freaked out by this. And the reason- Those are he, my words, by the I know, way. I know, I know. I think he's, I, he's I, a different term. No, he, well, he didn't call them out either. He didn't call anybody out. No, he, no, but-, um, but he, he did hint yeah. to one company right so after. So I think, but what I think actually, and we see it in the data, that 30% are looking at putting their AI on hyperscalers in the, in the survey from ETR. So I think when you start to look at that, I think the actual beneficiaries of Databricks doing this are those clouds. If you're S3 and EC2, if you're Redshift, no. Yeah, but again, we know where the money's buried in those companies, and I think S3 would be very happy to have Iceberg on top of it. And I think Bring you'll, it. I agree. And I think yeah. you'll find that you'll find that the other people like Redshift yeah. will embrace. Yeah, I don't think Matt Garman's upset yes. about yeah. it. No. I, I, well, we'll I, ask he, him. I think he's looking at it going, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I no, think he's I, looking know at it, hey, say, he's one say. of my tenants is about yeah. to bring way more data here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is awesome. Thrilled. Matt Garman's a straight shooter. Every time I've interviewed Matt Garman, I got one coming up on the 16th, as you know, exclusive. He always asks the direct question, he answers the direct question, and he's, he's, he answers it factually as best he can. Yeah, so did Jassy always. Jassy was like yeah. that too. But if you ask a bad question, they shut you down. Um, <laughs> I want to get your take, Rob, on this because I think this was interesting that came out of the data. Is that if you look at the data bricks, uh, what Ali said about um, um, their numbers at the end, business performance, is it coming from where is it coming from? Where is the data bricks gaining share? 
because the survey data kind of splits it. You can see it's clearly a rising tide, right? Everyone's going to win. The hyperscalers scored well. Everyone scored well on the survey. One of the things that we Where, missed. Where's Databricks getting the growth from? One of the things we missed in the survey, I don't know how we missed this, was we didn't ask the cost question. And I think Ali correctly said, look, in, it's in the era of ZERP, nobody cared. What, what do I care if I spend a few more bucks on storage or compute, doesn't matter. Now everything flipped. When interest rates rose, that opened the, the floodgates for, he even said a year and a half, two years ago, that opened the floodgates for Databricks. We saw that in the data, where, and we heard it at Snowflake Summit two years ago where people said, we're taking data out of Snowflake, running it elsewhere. Databricks obviously was an obvious place to do the, the data engineering, data pipeline work because it's less expensive. And, and I think that was a real tailwind for these guys. Is yeah. that where the growth's coming from? I, I think the, the growth is happening across the board for them because I think there's people that have taken another look that we're doing it, we're the data science people, and then the people on the data warehousing side have said, hey, we're already using this, it's at this cost point, why don't we start with a project over here? So I think on the SQL side of the house, they're also growing, so, I mean, just, what they were talking about at the Data and AI Summit inside the analyst thing that I can't go into the details. I think you're right, but Rob. But they, they said the growth numbers on, and they announced some on stage, were phenomenal for the, you know, the SQL side of the house, not just the, yeah. so. So look, at when the economy yeah. tanks, Walmart does really well, yeah. right? And yeah. so they benefited, Databix definitely benefited from cost optimization. And then I think people went there and said, wow, we actually, this is pretty good, let's invest some more. And you can see, we see it in the ETR data. Snowflake's still doing very well, but Databricks has, has held yeah. the, the spending momentum for the last two years while, while Snowflake has yeah, accelerated. Ali was very much candid on this point. He's like, he addressed the cost cutting to your point about the recession or change of the economy, but they're also scoring big points on the innovation side, which is the AI. So I think they scored big time points on the marketing of we're developers. And I think the open format reinforces that yeah. and they stand out, they jump off the page. Snowflake looks like they're catching up, although they do, they're humble, a little bit different orientation as a company. Databricks a little more aggressive than Snowflake, although Snowflake can be aggressive in their own way, as you know, um, but they're just different companies. I think Snowflake's number one, clearly, and Databricks is number two, but they're just different. So what, what's interesting is, and you know, we, we sit on all of these briefings and everything like that, People are taking shots at Databricks now about the cost of Databricks. Interesting. Like when you see when, and I, I'm think I believe the numbers that were out there. I, I saw some from Oracle when they talked about doing certain workloads, and I, I think for me, to there are I think everybody's got rough edges, and I, I think what Speak you have for to, yourself, Rob. Well, I, 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 got, I don't rough edges all over the place, but uh, when you start to look at all of this. The cost, the cost could be greater in certain instances using Databricks versus, I, I think what they showed was cheaper, cheaper on Oracle, of course. Uh, it was more expensive on Databricks and even more expensive on Snowflake in certain instances. Was it Oracle data? Yeah, it was Oracle. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so I, I think and it was Oracle running. has an interesting you know, perspective on the market. Yeah. That's why we didn't talk about VAST at all. Well. VAST was up here saying, yeah. hey, data lakes are more expensive, but with VAST, mm -hmm. they're cheaper. Do you buy that? <laughs> well, in their space, they're yeah. I'd they're say really, in, really in the well. AI at scale, where you're talking about yeah, training, training massive, massive models, I, I think they probably are. I think when you start to look at owning the infrastructure versus renting the infrastructure, it's. I mean, we all know leasing or renting infrastructure is almost always more. Where expensive. scale out shared nothing yeah. finally hits its limits, yeah. which 20 years ago we didn't, we didn't, couldn't see that, but now it's, it's there. That's where Vast shines. Yeah. You know, and you know, they've got a lead there. They're taking advantage of those, hyper, those hyperscale LLMs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All they're positioned training. quite they're, well. A lot of training. They're, they're in an Absolutely. interesting spot. And they're sure. tight with CoreWeave and companies like that. Um, that we saw at GTC, the, the lunch we had um, yeah. with those guys, that, that, that was a, quite a testimonial. And VAST is at the heart of that. That's their file system that's running a lot of yeah. that stuff. It's so. great to have Jeff on theCUBE. It's awesome yeah. to see him. Yeah. Oh, He's like really good. I mean, you remember him from DDN. I do. Um, and so he learned. They were doing object store before object store with you know, yeah. technical computing yeah. chops. But I think they, the, the way they, they need to kind of, and I, I think they definitely have a lead. And I think they were definitely an early mover and 
vast being vast data and not vast storage, as Jeff will remind us all the time, yeah. which is a fantastic thing. I, I think when you start to look at the other ones with coming out with DGX superpods and they're superpod certified and things like that, I mean, you you have the others out there like Dell and Weka and Space, mm -hmm. you know, and NetApp with yeah. the E series and stuff like that. So I think there's others playing in that space. Are they going to have as I think it's yet to be seen who wins in that part of the market, in the infrastructure. And I think, to your point on SuperCloud 8, and I think uh, uh, Sanjeev was even talking about this, when you start to look at the infrastructure underneath these, I think some of those people are going to be part of this, you know, magnificent seven of data. I thought Jeff Demworth's comment, John, um, we tried, and Rob, you were on that interview too, we tried very hard not to be disruptive, which I was like, whoa wait a minute, you're like totally disruptive to the competitive landscape, mm -hmm. but he meant yeah. disruption to, to the processes to the that, that customers- Yeah, the, down to, yeah, right. to the user exactly. experience. Yeah, right. which and is, uh, that struck was, me too. That was striking. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it's smart. It's exactly what I think a lot of early stage endeavors, it doesn't matter if that's a small company or a big company miss, is they think they're trying to solve the solution not for the people that have to solve the solution with the tool. And when we miss that little link in the chain, you've got a bunch of, you know, startup graveyard or idea graveyard or spending graveyard that's pretty savage. Yeah. So, no, I, th I thought that was Don't cool. We heard a lot about that when we were talking to uh, QBO earlier as well, and definitely core to the conversation. All right, I got a question for you guys, because this has been a fabulous day. We could probably talk for the next 45 minutes about everything we learned. Since it's going to be coming up, not sure what our dates are, I'm sure somebody knows, Super Cloud 8, what do you hope to be able to say when we sit down at Super Cloud 8, or what do you expect to be able to say? What do you predict we're going to be able to say that we can't yet say at Super Cloud 7? So, we first of all, we're going to pick a topic, right? And it's probably going to be you know, back to AI. I think what I would like to sit, be able to say at the next Super Cloud is that Gen AI is starting to throw off measurable, meaningful, tangible ROI slash cash that's becoming self-funding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to say that. I don't that know. I think that's a great this year perspective. That, you yeah. know, yeah, a, a, but, that'll be a really interesting milestone. I think for the entire industry and and movement. We're, we're in the lift down. driver zone right now. We are that, that little yeah. vacuum between yeah. the old and the new. Yeah, 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 we absolutely are. It's a little unsettling. It, for, you do, well, yeah. it's, it's intriguing. <laughs> I mean, it we love our, it as a it media. makes our jobs yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Rob, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think I'm hoping to hear that people have figured out the terminology around agents and what, <laughs> and like we have some sort of hierarchy, either we put it together or with some of the other fantastic guests we had on here, put it together because right now, I think people are getting, they had enough, a hard enough time wrapping their head around Gen AI and now we're throwing agents at them and agents and you know networks of agents that are working together and those are data products or are they not data products and they're working with data products and oh, there's also AI over here. So I, I think I, whole taxonomy of this to make it simpler because right now there's a lot of confusion. Yeah, I actually like that QB is branded it as AI teammates. Yes. I think that actually makes sense because when you think of an agent, it in my brain, it's limited to a, a CS agent yeah. or to something that's yeah. more, you know, or I think where the, the normal consumer mind yeah. Yeah. tends to go is, is in that direction. John, what about you, your prediction? Uh, I think SuperCloud 8, we're probably going to be talking about the, everything we talked about today, nothing actually happened. I think it's going to be a slow process between what we're saying today around this next layer, um, because I think it's what we're talking about here is so radical, only the, the top people will still be innovating. I think the conversation of SuperCloud 8 will be, okay, what's my architecture look like? And it'll be more about where are we with the compute and storage and networking. The infrastructure will still be pacing. So we'll probably have it this year. So in this calendar year, I think we'll see movement towards the semantic layer conversations, but I don't think the needle moves much. I think it's going to still be kind of like people trying to figure things out, but I think it's going to go right back to where are we with the silicon? What's with this clustered systems? How do I organize my vast What's my namespace look like? I think those conversations will be there. I think the surveys will kick into more directional like sentiment around strategic intent. Which workloads will be working on? And then who am I going to bet on? Which vendor, which supplier? I think there's a lot more of that that needs to get done in my opinion. Just to my, my feel from today was we got it right, but it's going to bake a little bit further 
and we see Star Tate out there, it's just going to be like, who do I pick? What's my partner? Who's my GSI? What's going to happen? What do I do with my VMware? What do I do with this? I mean, it's going to be so much going on with this. That aligns with Mulham's prediction. He basically said, there's a lot of work to do. You're, it's you know, a mm -hmm. shitload of work. In the near term, it's kind of end of the decade type of thing, maybe spills into the next decade, yeah. next decade before we see this true silo busting, you know, simplification from the developer experience. We're a ways away from This it. survey, and why I call it the mother of all surveys, because what Ali Gatsi was so excited to be on theCUBE was, not only did it make, make them look good, it made everyone look good, but he was even more positive because it does validate what he's been saying for years and what we've been saying on theCUBE. So to me, this event uh, is significant because SuperCloud 7 was the first time with the survey data that you guys co-authored was pointing real evidence that this transition's happening, and that mm -hmm. is huge. And it's only, it's only going to get more. So SuperCloud 7, we're going to be, we're going to be eight, we'll be getting more data. I think that's going to be our job, and I still think we got to get the infrastructure. A shout out up. to our partners at ETR. I mean, yeah. they, Absolutely. Okay, yeah. Record time, yeah. deep they, analysis, and fantastic. And they made it, they made it very simple, like the polling uh, <laughs> of, for the presidential election. Yeah. So I, I think that, again, being able to do those comparisons and all of that, <laughs> they, they, they killed it. It's like, the, it's like the election, based on whoever wins the NFC or AFC wins the Super Bowl. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's always, the economy, like a, there's yeah. always yeah. a you know, law, big numbers, <laughs> what's the freaking, freakonomics. The question <laughs> yes. is, if <laughs> Republicans win, <laughs> snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> and that, folks, <laughs> that <laughs> folks is a conversation <laughs> yeah. for a another that segment. Tune yeah. in when we yeah. talk about election tech, which um, I really love to do. The question is, data, who's the Democrats and Republicans in the data battle? Uh, That's a whole other separate cube after dark <laughs> conversation. Well, we could look at some of the donations. We could look at some this of the Friday, donations we're going to bring on right it up now, on the and I think we'll tell, tell, tell a very interesting story. Gentlemen, this has been a really yeah. great day. I just yeah. want to say thank you to the three of yeah. you. We had some wonderful guests. Thank you for coming in. Hey, Appreciate my pleasure. Any, anytime you'll have me, and you're happy yeah. to come a contribute. Really love seeing the diversity on the stage today, everyone. Thank you. Great yeah, and, and you know, we had a couple of the women tech athletes drop out, unfortunately, last minute. We had two others. That's, yeah. that's too bad. Yeah, 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 you know? that's right. But yeah, we really do make an effort mm -hmm. to, to include as, as many you know, people of color and diverse backgrounds, and really proud of the support we've given for women in tech. The data so, business is, is really yeah. getting really diverse in a fast way. If you look at WIDS and what's happening. We're rooting that, we're AI fighting that WIDS and, fight. And get into the coding, but um, yeah, it was a great event. I mean, we got SuperCloud here, we have VMworld coming up, and Savannah, our favorite show, because we've been going on for three years, is Supercomputing hey. coming up. And Down in Atlanta. Show me your hardware, baby. Supercomputing is a is a canary in the coal mine. Yeah, I love that. Give us a, it's a harbinger. You're it right. Brings, it, it brings in the chips, cloud scale, and AI because it's an AI show. And like we saw with Jensen at uh, GDC for NVIDIA, you know, his big thing was the platform shift at the physical layer. And his big theme was democratizing supercomputing. That's what NVIDIA is trying to do. So as that supercomputing horsepower comes in, that that's huge. why I think we're going to see more infrastructure. Then the bit will flip. And then I think your point right, AI native starts will pop out. But you're going to see a lot of startups coming out of the woodwork, I think, once they see that horsepower. Yeah. I think you're absolutely yeah. right. We've got we've got an exciting couple of weeks ahead. We have an exciting full day of coverage tomorrow as well for our two days of coverage here of SuperCloud 7. Get ready for the next gen data platform. I am delighted to be supported by our fabulous production crew that you cannot see, but thank you to everyone here who scheduled and coordinated and made us all look so beautiful on cam and interfaced with our fabulous guests wherever they were around the world today. And thank you all for tuning in. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news. <laughs>